In case you've sinned in the last few minutes, which is always possible, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you, as a believer priest, the privacy of the priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one to bring to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have an article here out of Great Britain, and it's regarding the rising gas prices and the uh, what you call inflation that comes out of it. There will be hyperinflation later this year uh, due to uh, the weakening of the dollar. The dollar, by the way, is the world's currency. That's what everyone trades off of and people are so shocked by how much we're spending and printing that the world wants to get off of the dollar as a currency uh... what that if that happens what that means is a tremendous shock to the united states economy that it's very hard to even describe there are reasons behind it economic reasons why it would happen for example the united states kinda has a free pass when it comes to buying oil because oil is exchanged using the dollar so when the dollar goes down the whole world the whole world is trading on the dollar so the value here doesn't seem to be effect affected that much even though it's still going up you get off the world you get off the dollar and go to a system of gold or go to the Chinese yuan which is of course what the Chinese want to do then you will have uh, people not uh, buying the dollar anymore and that means uh, the dollar will lose value precipitously and you will see inflation like you've never seen it before we will become a third world country overnight and this has happened in the past uh, when uh, other nations had used their currency and then they went off of their currency they became a relic of history great britain happens to be one of those and this is out of uh, the united kingdom Nick Clegg earlier this week made a pitch for the hearts of quote alarm clock Britain those who come rain or shine and busy making Britain tick he was right to identify working people as being in need of support having been taken for granted during the labor years but what is the point in supporting people when they are emerging bleary eyed from under their duvets if you are then going to kick them in the teeth when they go outside and get into the car. Fuel prices yesterday were nudging their record highs of July 2008. Unleaded petrol was averaging 128 a pound, or actually 128 a pound per liter. That's how they, uh, they use the metric system over there. It's per liter, not per gallon. 128 a pound is about $3 a liter. Extrapolate that into a gallon, you're talking seven, eight, nine dollars Diesel at 132 a liter. And what is the government doing to help those who rely on their cars? Actually about eight, seven to nine is a big range. And what is the government doing to help those who rely on their cars to get to work every day? It plans to raise duty by a penny over inflation in April this year and every year until 2014. While the government's preferred inflation index is the Consumer Price Index, CPI, which stands at 3.3%, when it comes to jacking up petrol prices, the Treasury prefers the Higher Retail Prices Index, RPI, which stands at 4.7%. With, with fuel duty already at just under 59 uh, pence per liter, that's about a, a dollar a liter, it means that motorists in April face prices surging by another four pence a liter. And then, of course, there's an advertisement. Express Casino, get a free bonus of up to 150 pounds now. 
This, of course, is on top of the three rises in fuel duty that have already happened over the past year, a penny in April, a penny in October, 70.76 pence in January, and on top of the 2.5% VAT, that's a value-added tax, imposed on January 4th. Uh, value-added taxes like a sales tax that we have in the states. All in all, it means that by April, motorists will be paying 10 pence more to the government for every liter of fuel they buy than a year ago. We all know there's a budget deficit that needs to be closed, but higher fuel taxes strike right at the heart of the economic recovery. Last October, Work and Pension Secretary Erin Duncan Smith implored the unemployed of Metier to get on the bus and look for work 25 miles away in Cardiff. The underlying point he was making was sound that in the dynamic economy people need to be prepared to travel long distances to look for work. And then of course this is a, a type of local issue but the rising gas prices have affected everyone in the world including us in the United States it's resulted in higher food prices. The weakening dollar has done so as well, along with floods in Australia and around the world. Some very odd weather conditions have caused sugar and other things, other commodities, to go through the roof, and not to mention the lowering of the dollar. So there are riots right now occurring in third world countries, from Tunisia, which just replaced one bad government with another, and in other places like Egypt, where they don't have the wealth to absorb the rising food cost. And if you've been to the store lately, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is inflation. And inflation is part of the third cycle of discipline. And the Bible describes it as you work all the harder, but uh, you get nothing more out of it. That's inflation. Now to the 23rd Psalm. And we will get the corrected translation from Psalms 23.1 onward. Psalms 23.1 is a song of grace orientation, and now more than ever we need to put Bible doctrine into our stream of consciousness. Psalms 23.1, a song of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who keeps on shepherding me. I cannot lack anything, verse 2. He causes me to lie down in pastures of choice grass. He leads me to waters of refreshment. Verse 3. He restores my soul, rebound. He guides me in the wagon wheel tracks of righteousness because of his person. That is the post-salvation spiritual life. Verse 4. In addition to this previous verse, when I walk through a death-shadowed valley, I cannot fear evil, the manner of dying, because you with me, your rod, divine discipline, and your staff, divine deliverance, they comfort me. Then in Psalms 23, 5, which we studied the last hour, you have prepared, deployed, a table in front of me for my benefit in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Verse 5 is the hospitality metaphor. Jesus Christ is the host, David the guest. As the host, Jesus Christ provides, in the divine initiative of grace, a table the table for us references our spiritual skills. The anointing references grace promotion. And the overflowing cup refers to escrow blessings for time and eternity. And part of that overflowing cup for you as a believer in the church age is the hall of records in which God will keep a history book of divine viewpoint in which every invisible hero in the church age will be mentioned as influencing history. Presidents won't be mentioned unless, of course, they executed the protocol plan of God. And that rarely happens. Um, a few mighty are called, as Scripture says. And uh, most people you never heard of in all your life will be mentioned in this true history book. And you will see how the United States went on for maybe a century due to a certain person or several people. So God has provided everything we need for our journey. And also, as part of this journey, once we receive our escrow blessings, you can always go to that history book and see your very own name. So this psalm was written at the lowest point in David's life in terms of testing. 
He had to flee from his son Absalom, the rebellious type. And David had enemies that had formerly been his closest friends. Grace orientation responds to all categories of grace in a manner compatible with grace. There are no works, no merit, no human good, no intrusion into God's plan with human resources. And that's the problem with most believers today. They rely on their own human talent, their own energy of the flesh. You see, the old sin nature has an area of weakness. That is where you are prone to sin. It also has an area of strength. That is your area where you produce human good. Human good is garbage. Isaiah 64, 6 makes that clear. All of our righteous deeds are as menstrual rags. That's for the unbeliever. It, also, it is also for the believer who is out of fellowship. Anything you can produce in the energy of the flesh is the same thing you could produce as an unbeliever. Menstrual rags, human good, wood, hay, stubble, all of which will become a great bonfire at the evaluation throne of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll all get to witness the greatest bonfire in all of human history when we see believers' good works going up in flames. Also in those flames will be precious stone. And that will be the only thing left. It will not be purged by the fire. And that uh, precious stone will be divvied out according to whoever produced in the uh, divine dinosphere whatever they produced. And the fastest way to produce divine good is to simply maintain the filling of God the Holy Spirit, reside inside God's power sphere under the two power options, the filling of the Spirit, plus the metabolization of the Word of God. You produce divine good when you log time inside of fellowship, and you might not be doing a thing except listening to the Word of God. That's divine good. That is precious stone, gold, silver, and precious stone. And uh, any time you witness under the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, gold, silver, precious stone. But the divine good is constantly being produced by the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Some of that divine good is totally unseen. And uh, the works of the Holy Spirit are described in Galatians. Part of that is your virtue love, personal love for God, the Father, impersonal love for mankind. What's impersonal love for mankind? It's simply grace orientation extrapolated out into maturity in which you understand the depravity of man. People are sinners. You don't react to it. You don't become bitter against people when they malign you, when they gossip about you, when, you judge, when they judge you. That's simply the old sin nature at work. You ignore it. Leave it in the Lord's hands. That's part of the fourth stage of the faith rest drill. When you do so, that's a production of divine good. Now, David was at his lowest point in terms of testing, but he was at his highest point in life concerning grace orientation. And that is when he wrote this very famous psalm, the Psalms, the 23rd Psalms. Now, God is the host. He's provided the table. That's anal analogous to God providing for us our problem-solving devices. David's going to use these problem-solving devices and win the war against Absalom. David is not going to lose his anointing as king. And as a guest, uh, David will not lose his problem-solving devices. Distinguished guests were customarily met at the door when they entered the banquet hall and were anointed with some very expensive oil or, per or perfume. This is what David is referring to when he says, you anoint my head with oil. It's not an actual anointing, as it were, but an analogy. The anointing of the head with oil is a reference to promotion. So David's not going to lose his promotion as king. He's not going to lose his promotion as soldier, so, so he's going to win this battle. So what God provides in grace, only God can remove. God's promotion of you is based upon your spiritual life, and it cannot be canceled by the antagonism of others, which will always be around. You can destroy yourself through your very own volition. You make Bible doctrine not number one, but number two, or maybe not even on your radar screen. Anything less than number one is useless, and you destroy yourself. And But the conspiracy of others cannot remove God's promotion. Whom God promotes, uh, they cannot be demoted by mankind. Your promotion is related to what's in your soul. Your enemies 
can't take that away from you. And if you grow enough spiritually, you will, you will have enemies. If God does not promote you, you're not promoted. You're not promoted because of what others think of you. Uh, you're not promoted by others or using others. And this is all related to the spiritual life. And all of that is related to your very own volition. So David is facing the adversity of revolution. A terrible adversity. Revolution is always evil. Not the fight for independence at our country uh, fault. But any type of revolution like the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in the early 1900s. All these revolutions simply replace evil government for evil government. But that is not our subject. Our subject is the fact that evil people cannot overthrow the power of God. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. He that is in the world is the reference to Satan and his cosmic system. And Satan would have loved for David to have been overthrown by Absalom. Satan loves revolution, for he was the first revolutionary ever. He planned a revolt against God and said, I will be like the Most High God. Anyone who follows up with that thinking is on the side of Satan. And Absalom thought he could overthrow his father. So Absalom became arrogant, and he covered his father's throne. But God makes war against the arrogant believer, but he gives grace to the humble. And it's obvious from the 23rd Psalm, Psalms that David had grace orientation, and so he's not going to lose out in any way. The fall of Absalom is described in Luke 14, 11. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be promoted. So never covet what the Lord has not given you under the divine initiative of grace. James 4.10 puts it this way, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will promote you. Humility is the fastest way to God's promotion. For humility, in a nutshell, describes the spiritual life. The only way you're going to follow the spiritual life is through humility. The first act of humility for the unbeliever, in terms of a spiritual act of humility, is faith alone in Christ alone. For the unbeliever has to give up all of the works, all of the things that he has done in the past to try to please God. This is especially true for the religious type unbeliever who thinks that he's impressing God by fasting, by tithing, by following the Mosaic law, or if you go into foreign lands by worshiping foreign gods, by abstaining from meat, all of the religions throughout the world have a system of taboos and moral code to follow. The uh, Muslim has five uh, tenets they must follow. They have to pray toward Mecca three times a day, etc. All of this is energy of the flesh. And in, when you believe in Christ, you say, I can't do it. I cannot reach God by my own merit, by what I'm doing. I can only reach God by faith alone, in Christ alone, and that means you're giving up your whole lifestyle of arrogance, and it takes humility to do so. That's why so few religious people ever believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then after salvation, you have to come to understand 1 John 1, 9, and you have to understand that it's not related to you at all. It's related to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Imputed to Jesus Christ on the cross were all the sins of all of human history, both believers' sins and unbelievers' sins. But there's a system that you must follow. God's system for the believer is 1 John 1 9. That's why Lewis Perry Schaefer said 1 John 1 9 is the John 3 16 of Christendom. At one moment in time, the unbeliever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of his pre salvation sins are forgiven. On top of that, all the scar tissue of the soul is wiped out. And as a believer now, you start with a clean slate with equal privilege and equal opportunity. But after you uh, remain in fellowship for a short time, during that lag time after you believe in Christ, the old sin nature will rear its head. You'll have, more than likely, a mental attitude sin first. And that will throw you out of fellowship. The only way to get back into fellowship is to understand 1 John 1, 9, Psalms 32, 5 among other passages related to the rebound technique. 1 John 1, 9 is the easiest for us to, to remember, and it's written specifically for us in the church age. Psalms 32, 5 was written uh, by David in the Old Testament, so we see that 
rebound was just as valid in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. It's always valid. It's transdispensational. It covers all the period from Adam and Eve all the way to the last human being alive on the earth. Rebound will be used in the millennium. And you simply name your sins to God and follow the procedure. Anything outside of that procedure brings in human merit, human works. You say, I want to feel sorry for my sin. That's you wanting to do something. And you are, as it were, canceling out or trying to cancel out what Christ did on the cross. The only thing you're doing is canceling out the spiritual life for you. You've made a choice that you're going to do it on your own. That you're going to take the guilt of your sin and you're going to make a great display of your guilt before God. Yet that guilt was taken care of on the cross and God is not impressed with what you can do. Not at all. And in fact, that's part of where 99% of Christians go astray. They think that the spiritual life is them doing something. Them feeling sorry for their sins. Them having a guilt complex, which is sin in itself. The Bible commands us to be happy. I've never seen a happy person suffering from a guilt complex. In fact, the guilt complex is the number one reason for suicide. And so that is not related at all to the spiritual life whatsoever. Simply name your sins to God. Very simple. You say too simple. It wasn't simple for our Lord Jesus Christ who did the work for us. So in the Absalom revolution, David will lose his son Absalom. But he will not lose his spiritual skills. He will not lose his promotion as king. And he will not lose his escrow blessings. The table, the anointing, and the cup are often compared to hospitality in the ancient world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the host at the table. David is our Lord's guest. We too are our Lord's guest. And the cup of blessings is grace hospitality from our Lord. And you know that when you're a host, you're the one doing all the work. You're the one setting up the table, putting out the dishes, putting out the silverware, the cups. You fill the cups with whatever beverage your guests want. And that's what a good host does. A good host does all the work. The guest sits and enjoys the meal. There's no work involved for you as a believer except to have the volition to partake of the blessings. To eat of the food, eat the word of God, metabolize the word of God. To drink from the cup, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, etc. So the host initiates the grace hospitality, and David simply responds with grace orientation by enjoying the meal. God has for us a wonderful meal, often described as such by our Lord and by David. The meal of the word of God that we are to take into our stream of consciousness and apply it to our lives. The meal is provided in grace. All we do is eat and chew it up. And eating is often used in scripture because every evil human being and every good human being, whatever you consider good, has eaten. Hitler ate and drank lots of beer. And what he, when he ate, the food reached the traffic signal, the epiglottis. It closed off the pipeline to the lungs and it went into his stomach. Now, evil was a Hitler. Hitler was an evil man, yet he still ate. That was grace provision, and it didn't matter how evil Hitler was. Every time food hit the traffic signal, it went into his stomach and not into his lungs. That's grace. And then there are those like the Apostle Paul who executed the spiritual life, and when he ate, it too hit the epiglottis, closed off his windpipe, and went into his stomach. So it doesn't matter if you're the Apostle Paul or Adolf Hitler, you still eat and drink. That's grace. And this is why the Bible brings out eating. For when we eat and when we have lunch today, it's going, the food will hit our epiglottis. And if we're still to live, it will go into our stomach and not into our lungs. And we don't, and when we eat, we don't choose where it goes. It just happens. We don't think to our brain, okay, brain. The food is now at the epiglottis. Cut off my windpipe. No, it happens by grace, where we are fearf fearfully and wonderfully made. And so by grace, the food goes into the stomach and is metabolized. And you did nothing except eat. And when it comes to the spiritual life, you do nothing except eat the word of God. But you have to follow the policy. And there's a policy to eating, too. You have to put it in your mouth and chew it up. And you do so 
instinctively. Uh, when a baby is first born, born, they say, well, we have to teach to eat. I didn't see where any teaching went on. It just started eating and uh, drinking the formula, etc. And so even a baby with no knowledge of vocabulary or anything can swallow, and it goes into the stomach and not into the lungs. So this is grace, and if even a spiritually a, a baby that's born spiritually dead, no vocabulary, uh, totally helpless. If a baby can eat, then of course that's grace. So under the ancient laws of hospitality, it didn't matter who was the guest, but what mattered was who is the host. Hospitality always depends on the host and not the guest. And that's true when you're a host. If you want to be a good host, of course nowadays with uh, the old sin nature running rampant among uh, believers, there are, of course, bad hosts, but the Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect host, and he does all the work. So hospitality depends upon the host, and if you have a bad hostess, you have a bad experience. If you go to a restaurant and have a bad hostess, who doesn't bring you the water when you need it or whatever beverage you're drinking, and brings your food out cold and your steak raw, you've just had a bad experience, not because of you, but because of a bad host. So it's still all dependent upon the host. You're not going to run back there and start cooking the steak on your own. If you had done that, you would have been the host yourself. So we have grace, and David is the guest, and he is the recipient of grace blessing. And he will not lose the table that was prepared by God. He will not lose the anointing in which he was anointed by God. He will not lose his overflowing cup, which is overflowing because of God. And he is separated from them at the moment under this testing, but he's not lost any of it. David will not lose his cup, for his escrow blessings for time are assured. And what is true for David is true for you. That's why the 23rd Psalms is for our edification. When you possess, excuse me, when you possess your escrow blessings, it's because you've executed God's plan and you can't lose those escrow blessings. Now flip over to the Psalms 23, verse 6. Verse 6 is another metaphor. This one is a military metaphor. Military metaphors are used all throughout Scripture. The Apostle Paul used them quite frequently, and that's uh, more than likely due to the fact that his family had been contracted to make uh, tents for the military, and he was very familiar with the Roman military as a result, even though he never served in the Roman military. But we have the third metaphor, the military metaphor. By the way, the whole book of Numbers is based upon military preparedness. We've lost track of that as we go through our cycles of discipline. Psalms 23.6 No doubt about it, both prosperity, benefit, happiness, and grace will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What we notice from Psalms 23.6, corrected translation again, no doubt about it, both prosperity, meaning benefit and happiness, both prosperity and grace will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is the aggressor in the divine initiative of grace. So when God pursues David, there is great blessing. The momentum of, of offensive action on the part of the divine initiative of grace results in the blessing of a grace pursuit. For the believer who is faithful in the function of his spiritual life, post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation for the believer in the church age, post-canon. This believer who is faithful in the function of the spiritual skills, this will result in the pursuit of grace in two categories. Category number one, the believer's grace orientation to the divine initiative of antecedent grace in time. That means you are oriented to grace and understanding that God knew about you in eternity past, antecedent means beforehand. 
And God provided for you in eternity past. Before you were ever born, God knew about you and provided for you. This is antecedent grace, and in order to have grace orientation, you have to have an understanding of the omniscience of God, all-knowing, knowing all the facts simultaneously in eternity past, the um, omnipotence of God, meaning all-powerful, and from this he's able to pursue us. Number one, the believer's grace orientation to antecedent grace in time. And number two, the believer's grace orientation to eschatological grace, in the eternal state. This means we understand that we have a future. David mentions that when he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is understanding that when we pass away, we are in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away. That's part of understanding eschatological grace and knowing where you're going when you die. And after you believe in Christ, you have eternal security. You can't lose it. Anyone who says they can lose their salvation is a moron, an idiot, uh, ignorance plus arrogance, the worst combination ever. And they think they can maintain their eternal life. They can no more maintain their eternal life than they can maintain their physical life through taking vitamins, eating right, etc. Uh, you can do all that and exercise you want. When it's your time to go, you're gone. And you can't even maintain your physical life. How in the world are you going to maintain your soul life in the eternal state? It's impossible. You are so full of yourself, it's unbelievable. I can barely even describe it. Most people try to poo-poo it and say, oh, that's just how they think. You know, well, they think very stupidly ignorantly, and they will never ever come to grace orientation. If they believed in Christ in the first place, they're saved and have eternal security, and that's as far, far as it goes for them. They don't even know they're eternal, eternally secure, and when they die, they sin face to face with death. They're going to realize they didn't do enough to maintain their salvation, and they're going to have a nervous breakdown and think they're going to hell when in fact they believed at some point in time and are going to heaven. Even the ox knows he has an owner, that's what scripture says. The ox is a dumb animal, and it knows he has an owner. And when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were purchased for a price, the price of the Lord Jesus Christ, dying as a substitute for you on the cross. And if he purchased you, you see there's also scripture that states, God does not wish that anyone should perish. So if you've gotten to the point of faith alone in Christ alone, you've passed that point of perishing. And since God does not want you to perish, he's not going to load you up with heavy burdens to follow some moral code or some taboos of not smoking, not drinking, not dancing, not chewing, not going with girls who do, all of that stuff. If you follow all those taboos and think that's maintaining your eternal security, you are foolish. You are stupid, ignorant, arrogant. And the combination of the two make you one of the worst people on the face of the earth. The worst people to ever come in contact are believers who don't know that they've been purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ. work on the cross. They've been bought. They are owned, whether they know it or not. The ox knows he has an owner, but these believers are dumber than oxen. So the greatest offensive action in history occurs in the church age as the divine initiative of grace. And we are on the defensive against Satan. That's found in James 4.7, 1 Peter 5.9, and Ephesians 6.13. 6, 6, there is no offensive action against Satan. You can beat the air and say, get behind me, Satan, all you want. You're just making yourself look like a fool. It's a defensive action, and God gives us all the defensive material that we need in order to defend our soul from being overrun by stress. So we have the deployment of grace orientation on the flat line of your soul. And this will result in individual offensive action. But the flat line of the soul is not only designed for defensive action against Satan, but at the same time, it's a staging area for offensive action in terms of the individual initiative of the church age believer. And you have individual initiative. And I can't, mot I have the right as a pastor to try to encourage you, but I can't motivate you in such a way as to make a decision for you as to make the Word of God number one priority in your life. I can't, uh, after I'm done speaking, I can't get up in your face and say, keep on thinking about what I taught. That's up to you. And so the individual initiative is yours. You have the freedom to choose. And that freedom means you can say, 
I understand the word, I believe it, and I'm going to, going to apply it to my life. Or you can just be the gnosis type and say, I understand it. Don't really care either way. Or you can be the, that would be the neglectful type. Or you can be the anti antagonistic type to say, I heard what you said about eternal security and I was offended because you called me an idiot and a moron. Yes, you are. And so you as an idiot and a moron will reject the doctrine of eternal security which is found all throughout scripture, neither shall anyone snatch you out of his hand, and you'll reject that, and you'll go on your way and die the sin face to face with death. Realize that you were a sinner, even though you tried to deceive yourself into thinking you weren't. And once you realize that, you'll say, I wasn't good enough to maintain my eternal security, and you will die a miserable death, and you won't even know you're in heaven until you uh, expire your last breath, and you'll probably even be shocked to be there. Then you'll be doubly shocked when you see me there with crowns and you there uh, with your taking offense to the doctrine of eternal security. So Christian offensive action is designed to utilize the divine initiative of grace to become a winner believer. What this means is simply this. It takes your volition to become a winner believer. What think ye of the word of God? And the answer must be number one priority. If it's number one priority, you will become a winner believer with fantastic impact both for time and eternity. Your name will wind up in the greatest history book, the truest history book of all history of all human and angelic history of which you had impact not only on the earth but also in terms of the angelic conflict. The principle from the 23rd Psalm is that you don't have to look for grace. In his fantastic mercy, God has provided prosperity and grace, and he pursues you with them. Grace pursues us. We don't pursue grace. If we pursued grace, it would cease being grace. It would demand something on our part. Psalms 89.20 and Psalms 89.49 show that David was always pursued by grace. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever is a reference to the divine initiative of eschatological grace. Meaning, David understood the eternal state and understood that he will be pursued for all of eternity by blessing. And no one will ever be depressed in the eternal state. People will become depressed on earth. Mature believers will become depressed on earth. Depression is not sin. It's a physiological matter, oftentimes solved in the case of Timothy by taking a little wine and in most cases today solved by other means. So Peter describes the house of the Lord in 2 Peter 3.13. We are looking forward with confidence to a new heavens and a new earth in which perfect righteousness dwells. And this is, of course, eschatological grace, knowing what's going to happen in the eternal state. And Peter says we are looking forward with confidence to a new heavens and a new earth in which perfect righteousness dwells. And this means Peter is looking forward to the destruction of the universe as we now know it, the nuclear fission event, in which this universe and its trillions and trillions and trillions of light years, a light year, by the way, is six trillion miles, and there are trillions and trillions of light years. And in one light year, it's not very far when compared to the universe. So when you look up at the stars and feel small, you're thinking correctly. You are small. Six trillion light. One year of light traveling is six, is six trillion miles. I said in the past that the angels were made of light. That's not even possible. They're made of something translucent. They're not made of light as we know it. For light as we know it only travels at uh, 6 trillion miles per year. Yet the angels have access to the throne of God, access to this earth. Even the fallen angels have access to the throne of God and access to the earth uh, upon their immediate command. They are uh, not made of light as we know it. Uh, probably some translucent substance that we're not an element that we aren't even familiar with in any way, shape, or form much in the way our resurrection body will have, uh, you'll be able to touch it and such, but it can still go through walls, something that we're not familiar with in any way. 
elements that aren't part of this world or this universe. And all of that will be destroyed. And then there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, probably made up of the elements that we now do not even understand. So grace orientation is grace response to what God has provided in grace. The response of grace at salvation is a one-time decision. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So grace orientation and the problem-solving device involves daily decisions regarding rebound, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, the metabolization of Bible doctrine, the deployment of the problem-solving devices. Grace orientation is the fourth battalion on the flot line of your soul. Flot is a military acronym for forward line of troops. So grace orientation is the believer's response to the divine initiative of grace. The flot line of the soul is not only des designed for defensive action against Satan, but, that, but at the same time, the flat line of the soul is the staging area for the individual initiative of the believer in offensive action in order to take the high ground of spiritual maturity. This is intensified under any type of testing. And when you're going under testing, if you have the right attitude, you will not faint under it, but will accept it as a badge of honor and knowing that you're about to break through into a, another part of maturity uh, and, and into uh, gl maximum glorification of God. So the fact that we are pursued by grace means that grace orientation is one of the two battalions. It is part of the problem-solving devices on the flat line of your soul, and it is also assigned to offensive action. The other battalion assigned to a fiction, uh, offensive action is impersonal love for all mankind, which we will study at a future date. The offensive action of grace orientation is directed toward all members of the human race, and the support for this offensive action will become impersonal love for all mankind. One way to understand impersonal love for all mankind is to understand this host metaphor. It's all up to the host in his grace action. It's all up to the host to set the table. All up to the host to give you the beverage that you prefer. All up to the host to provide a nice meal. All up to the host to make you feel comfortable. All up to the host to provide popcorn during the movie, etc. And this host will treat you in a gracious manner, whether you're a good guest or a poor guest. Uh, if you have a lot of people gathering for a party, there will no doubt be a bad guest who has mental attitude, sins, bitterness, and they sit off in a corner because they've had a bad day, and they sulk, yet they still receive from a good host the same type of food, and uh, oftentimes, if such a person is showing bitterness, the hostess will go out of the way to make sure everything is okay with that person. That is grace orientation, and it's also part of understanding impersonal love, meaning how you treat others is dependent upon you, the subject. You are the subject. You are the host, as it were, when it comes to the expression of impersonal love for mankind. One way to know what impersonal love is, it's totally devoid of bitterness, mental attitude, sins, judging, gossip, maligning, all of those. If you're a legalist, you'll never get close to grace orientation or impersonal love. Everyone who walks around you will be walking on eggshells. You will self-righteously look down your nose at others for not being as good as you are, and you're the worst type of host because you don't understand grace. But God is, uh, God's policy is grace, so he is the perfect analogy for a perfect host. And when you have impersonal love for all mankind, it's all dependent upon your integrity, dependent upon who and what you are, not dependent upon the object. The object may be obnoxious. Maybe the object wanted to watch a show on television, but everyone else wanted to watch something different. So he was overruled, and they watch a show that he doesn't like, and he sulks because he wants to be in control of the entire situation. You still treat that person with impersonal love as the host. Oh, you still watch the show everyone else wants to watch. But that person is still treated in grace, and that person can act like a fool if they want. That's part of impersonal love. It's, it can also be known as professional love. If you work at a grocery store, 
And uh, I used to work at a grocery store, and you come into contact with all types of people. And I was a bagger. And uh, some of the people were just crazy. You always run into the crazy types. And uh, they had to have their uh, double bagged in paper. Well, fine. That's what you want. That's what you get. I am the worker. I must be professional. And then you have to do it a certain way. And some people are very picky. It doesn't. Uh, they want one thing in one bag, another thing in another bag. And you have to run around and uh, do whatever they want. That's part of professionalism. And you do it with a smile on your face. Uh, when it comes to the Christian way of life, this is called impersonal love. You have to maintain the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And, of course, have no feelings of bitterness, anxiety, whatnot, toward the person who is being a butt, as it were. And the same, it, that professionalism says the customer is always right. And they say that because people always have a tendency to say, well, the object is obnoxious, I will be obnoxious. And so the those involved in customer service said, well, they're always wanting an object, they're always blaming the customer, so we'll have to make it objective for them and say, look, your object is always right, no matter how they act. But under impersonal love, you don't even consider the object. You consider your own integrity, and you will not lower yourself to their level of stupidity. So that's what impersonal love is all about in a nutshell. So we have the distraction from grace, and that is always done by the arrogant skills. The distraction from grace orientation by the arrogant skills. Now that will conclude our study of the 23rd Psalm. Maybe I should go ahead and give you the corrected translation from uh, the beginning to where we just ended. Psalms 23.1, a song of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one who keeps on shepherding me. I cannot lack anything. He causes me to lie down in pastures of choice grass. He leads me to waters of refreshment. In the church age, waters of refreshment would be the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Choice grass would be the second power option. Operation Z, the metabolization of the Word of God. Psalms 23.3, He restores my soul, the rebound technique. He guides me in the wagon wheel tracks of righteousness because of His person. The experiential spiritual life, experiential righteousness, dikaiosune, capacity righteousness. Psalms 23, 4. In addition to this previous verse, when I walk through a death-shadowed valley, the uh, death-shadowed valley is uh, so stated as such due to the fact that uh, the light is intercepted by the Bible doctrine and the believer's soul casting a shadow. I cannot fear evil, the manner of dying, because you with me. Your rod, divine discipline, and your staff, divine deliverance, they comfort me. And then on down to verse uh, 6, the uh, military metaphor. No doubt about it, both prosperity, benefit, happiness, and grace will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That concludes the Psalms, Psalms 23. Now we'll take a look at the distraction from grace by the arrogant skills. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Second Corinthians 12, 7. And for this reason, referencing the function of blind arrogance, the use of of the three arrogant skills, self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And for this reason, that I should not begin to become arrogant, because of the extraordinary quality of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh for my benefit, an angel from Satan that he might torment me, that I should not begin to become arrogant. This is, of course, the Apostle Paul describing his providential preventative suffering. The Apostle Paul has just arrived at spiritual adulthood. And as part of that spiritual adulthood, there comes spiritual self-esteem. We note that when he says, because of the extraordinary quality of the revelations. The Apostle Paul had many spiritual gifts. Among those was the gift of knowledge, 
in which the direct knowledge from Jesus Christ was imputed to the Apostle Paul immediately. You see, there was no New Testament. There were no epistles. He had to write them. And so, from uh, Jesus Christ made all of these new revelations of the epistles available to Paul uh, more than any of the other apostles. And so there would be a tendency, of course, to become arrogant from spiritual self-esteem. But he did not become arrogant. And the reason why is providential preventative suffering. The thorn in the flesh. A lot of people go into... Uh, a type of speculation. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? And if you read in your commentaries, you'll see anything from baldness to migraines to failing eyesight. And usually it, it's all very subjective. It's whatever uh, the person who's reading for Second Corinthians is going through because they want to relate to Paul and think they're just as great as Paul in their arrogance. And so they say, I have migraines. Paul had migraines. Or they say, I'm bald and women don't like me. And I have a pot belly, and women don't like me. So Paul is bald and had a pot belly. And they go into all these contortions. Fact is, Scripture doesn't say what the thorn in the flesh is. All we know is that it came from a servant of Satan. So we have these three arrogant skills. And the Apostle Paul, at this point, uh, had the potential to fall under them, for he had a great revelation of doctrine. And this is where you have to keep grace orientation in the forefront because when you break into spiritual adulthood, it becomes a, a very dangerous time. A lot of times you just have enough doctrine to become arrogant and then you want to throw it around and tell everyone else how it is. You've reached spiritual self-esteem and in order for you to be humbled, God sends a thorn in the flesh. So the arrogant skills include self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And these are the greatest distraction to the function of your spiritual life. Even the Apostle Paul had to be warned and protected from these arrogant skills. Paul was so concerned about arrogance that he repeated himself twice in the same verse when he said that I should not begin to become arrogant. Now, the thorn in the flesh was not eye trouble, it wasn't malaria, it wasn't migraine, insomnia, epilepsy, baldness, speech impediment, being single, or Jewish persecutions. I can tell you definitely for the Apostle Paul, being single had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Uh, the Apostle Paul had the gift of celibacy, in which a double portion of his love went toward God. And he understood that marriage is actually a problem manufacturing device. Being single was no problem to Paul. Malaria, migraine, headaches, insomnia, epilepsy, baldness, all of this, this is just conjecture. No one really knows. Actually, Paul tells us in verse 10 what the thorn in the flesh was. It's actually a whole system of testing, people testing. The apostle Paul was always slandered. Fault testing. There was a lot of unusual pressure on the apostle Paul and in the book I'm writing on him, we'll see that whenever that gets done. He was a very unusual man. As a result, to whom much is given, much is expected. A lot of unusual pressure. There were injustices, a tremendous amount of injustices. He ended up imprisoned, I don't know how many times, but I'll know pretty soon. And he went through persecutions and troubles. Now, this demon could not possess Paul. Anyone who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be uh, indwelled by a demon, for we're, we are indwelled by the entire trinity, and there's no room for a demon. These are thorn demons, and they probably work through religious unbelievers. The thorn in the flesh produces preventative arrogant skills and momentum from the spiritual skills. So this is a prevention measure. Paul was so concerned about the thorn in the, in the flesh, he actually prays thrice, three times, for it to be removed. But the, this, we will note, was the wrong thing to do. In fact, every time he prayed three times, God came back with the same answer, no. And out of this comes, in the Greek, you won't see it in the English, it's called an elative conclusion. It's a conclusion that's simply understand, understood from the Greek language. 
it's almost uh, silent with regards to it because the Greek language is extraordinarily deep. That's why it is the language used for the New Testament epistles because in Greek lots of meanings are assigned to even one word. You can take a phrase in the Greek and turn it into a book almost in the English. It's a very deep language and why God used it. So this was not the right thing to pray. To pray, He was actually praying away testing. And you don't pray away testing. Remember, the only time we have this veil of tears is right now while we're alive on the earth. We have to sharpen our skills, sharpen our sword, hold up the shield of faith. And uh, the more you grow spiritually, the heavier that shield will become. Uh, just as a weightlifter starts off light and continues to build strength. And so you have to be able to lift up that shield of faith. And you would never do it if there was never any testing. And this uh, is simply illustrating that prayer is not a problem-solving device. When my pastor taught this, I don't know how many people about flipped the lid on it, because they've always thought of God as a genie. And they could just pray their way out of any situation. Prayer will solve all problems, etc. There's a place for prayer and a proper way to pray. And there's certain times when prayer is necessary and the uh, praying against certain uh, things that are occurring in your life. But this wasn't the time. This was testing. And there's a time for everything. And this wasn't the time to use prayer, but the time to use the spiritual life. So we see that prayer is not a problem-solving device. If it were, I wouldn't have to preach to you on a daily basis. All I would do is say, every time you have a problem, pray it away and pray fervently. If your marriage is having problems, pray. But you see, that can't work either because in marriage there's two volitions. And, you, and God does not dictate anyone's volition. God is a God of freedom. So if one person wants to leave a marriage, that's up to that person. And prayer is not going to stop it. Prayer is not a problem-solving device. It is the result of developing the problem-solving devices. You can be a great prayer warrior. You can pray for others. You can pray for yourself. You can pray for certain ministries. You can pray for the country, the president, the Congress. In fact, you're commanded to pray for the leaders. But prayer is not a problem-solving device. Whatever the function of the thorn demons, it brought Paul to the status of preventative arrogance. And the filling of God the Holy Spirit never demands that you justify yourself. When we sin, when we fail... Are you trying to excuse your sinfulness? Are you trying to justify your anger, your bitterness, whatever you've done? And this is called self-justification. And when we go into self-justification, we deny our sins. We superimpose our flaws on others through Operation Patsy. This is called projection. And this becomes self-deception. And then we become occupied with ourselves to the point of self-absorption. And you begin to circulate and cycle through these arrogant skills. And this will move the believer away from sanity and toward psychosis. And biblical documentation for self-justification and self-deception uh, is found in Ezekiel 7.10. Behold the day, behold it is coming, your doom has gone forth, the rod of discipline has budded, because arrogance has blossomed. Oh, welcome to the United States of America. Behold the day, it's here. Proverbs 16.8 Arrogance precedes destruction, and before the fall there is a lifestyle of arrogance. This lifestyle of arrogance is re referencing the recycling of the arrogant skills, justifying your sin, deceiving yourself into thinking you have a right to justify it, and then total self-absorption, what people call selfishness. Proverbs 23, 29. A person's arrogance will bring him low, but a lifestyle of humility will attain honor. Humility is referencing grace orientation. Self-justification and self-deception is the subject of 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, that's self-justification, we are deceiving ourselves, self-deception, and the doctrine is not in us. So what self-justification does in effect is says, I'm right, the world is wrong. 
Galatians 6, 7 states, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. Self-deception totally ignores this principle. Self-deception thinks they can pull the wool over everyone else's eyes, so they can also pull the wool over God's eyes. It's arrogance. It's like Satan thinks he can pull the wool over God's eyes. He, God knows everything. It's impossible. And so be not deceived. God is not mocked. Anytime you fail to rebound, you mock God. You walk around thinking you're right and that you are self-righteous and justified. You're mocking God. And whatever you sow, you will reap. And that's part of a simple... You see, when you go into self-justification and self-deception, you start making bad decisions from a position of weakness, and you start punishing yourself, not to mention the fact you're full of bitterness, jealousy, the arrogance complex of sins, plus the emotional complex of sins. You're torturing yourself. You start to move towards psychosis through the emotional revolt of the soul. You develop all types of mental handicaps, and you destroy yourself. And then God adds on to it, through discipline, for you don't get away with maligning, gossiping, judging, and you don't get away with triple compound discipline either. Hosea 8, 7, they that sow to the wind will reap the tornado. Proverbs 22, 8, he who sows wickedness reaps trouble, and the rod of his wrath is ready. He who sows wickedness is referencing the verbal sins, the mental attitude sins, and they will reap trouble. This is the concept of self-induced misery. And then on standby, if needed, is the rod of his wrath. It's ready. Galatians 6, 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That's the problem with over 95% of believers in this country. They think they're something when they're nothing. They think they're being spiritual by what they do, when you can only be spiritual by following God's system. They've deceived themselves into thinking they are living a spiritual life, and they've deceived themselves. They're not even close to it. They don't know what Eusebiah is. Eusebiah is translated godliness in many passages, which is ridiculous. Eusebiah is referring to the spiritual life. And they think the spiritual life, or as it's translated godliness, is something that they do, that they have to be godly. And they think that godly is anything from whatever their favorite taboo is. Up north, it's uh, don't smoke and don't drink in some denominations. And they say, well, this is godliness. Down south, they smoke more, so they might say, well, don't, uh, don't drink or don't dance, whatever. And they think that's godliness. And that's just related to some taboo. Some taboos are good, some taboos are bad, depending on the individual. You can't force a system of taboos on everyone. That's tyranny. And for some people... It's okay for them to have a few drinks. For others, it's not okay at all. And for some, they have to have a taboo. I cannot drink because I have a genetic predisposition toward alcoholism. So they have to make that choice. And that's their taboo for their situation, for wherever they are in their spiritual life and coming to realize that. And then there are others who don't have that gene whatsoever. And they can have two or three drinks and not desire any more whatsoever. And then they don't need to follow that taboo. Taboos are for the individual. And uh, we all have different areas where we might have to have our own individual taboo. But when you force it into a system or into a church, you've just turned uh, the gospel of Christ into a bunch of bad news. And people from the outside world look in there and they say, I don't want any part of that. These people are sticks in the mud. They can't do a thing. And you've brought shame to the freest of free lifestyles, the Christian way of life. Galatians 6, 3, if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. A lot of times down south they say, I've been going to church and I'm getting straight. Well, they're, they're always bringing themselves into the, uh, into the picture. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Aren't I so great? You are an arrogant fool. The one who is great is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has given you a unique spiritual life. And when you live that spiritual life, you're not even great, you're just a reflection of the prototype spiritual life. So self-absorption draws heavily from the arrogance complex of sins. And the arrogant skills perform a similar function to the spiritual skills except in reverse. 
the arrogance uh, skills make application of the sins of the arrogance complex and the sins of the emotional complex to experience. It is not a blessing whatsoever to be around those who are involved in the arrogant skills. In fact, they become a test, a thorn in the flesh to you. And this is what happened to the Apostle Paul. He was surrounded by a bunch of people who utilized the three arrogant skills. That became a thorn in his flesh, and he tried to pray it away, or pray them away, or pray all the testing away, the people fought in system, and disaster testing. He wanted it to be gone because it's uncomfortable. No one said testing would be comfortable. And he wanted it gone. But God said, no, no, no. And then we'll close with the elative conclusion that comes out of this, which we'll study more tomorrow. The elative conclusion states, man's solution is no solution. God's solution is the only solution. What was man's solution in the case of the Apostle Paul? Prayer, not a problem-solving device. And what was God's solution? The utilization of the three spiritual skills using the problem-solving devices, lifting up that shield of faith so it doesn't rust. If we could pray away every hardship that comes our way, we would never grow spiritually. And the Apostle Paul realized this as he was just now entering into adulthood, and he is recalling it and writing about it. Only baby believers try to pray away these things, or maybe right when you get into spiritual adulthood, and then as soon as you get there and go through a testing, you realize prayer is not a problem-solving device. God is not a genie. God does not work at McDonald's. And if you want a Big Mac with cheese, and you, or Big Mac comes with cheese, if you want uh, one of those meals, you, you can't well, rub the genie and say, uh, God, I'm hungry, give me this meal. He's not, he is not your servant, except in the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and bore your sins as a servant. But he's not your servant in terms of anything you want. You rub him like a genie and you'll get it. You say, but the uh, Bible says he'll grant you the desires of your heart. That's true, but the desires of your heart have to line up with his desires. And there are other passages that are related to the filling of the Holy Spirit that was available to the disciples, but they didn't even pray for it. And Jesus said, if you pray for it, I'll give it to you. And then people have interpreted that. Whatever I ask in prayer, I'll receive. In fact, that's a prayer not for us. It was a prayer for the disciples only. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will not receive, only if you pray that it be God's will. And of course, it will always be God's will whatever happens. So in that case, of course, your prayers are always answered in the affirmative. If it be your will, for example, uh, let Susie Q become well. If she becomes well, it was God's will. If she dies, it was God's will. Your, your prayer is answered in the affirmative either way. When you pray God's will, and that's how we are commanded to pray. Now, when you're going through testing, do not pray that it be removed. You just pray God's will. And prayer becomes a source of, from the faith rest drill even, of uh, comfort. Because you know God's will will come to pass, come to fruition. No matter what happens, it's God's will. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.